where it comes. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Diane, and I'm from the Park City Museum. Welcome to our lecture series. Uh, tonight, we have uh, Dr. Jose Alamillo um, talking about um, uh, an exhibit that we have coming in on uh, Latino baseball. So I'm going to go into a little bit about his biography, and then I'm going to turn it over to him. Dr. Emilio was born in Mexico and raised in California. His family worked in the year-round lemon industry, which allowed him to attend local public schools uninterrupted. At middle school age, he took part in University of California, Santa Barbara's Educational Opportunity Program, EOP, and earned BA degrees in sociology and communication at UCSB. He earned his MA and PhD in comparative cultures at the University of California, after completing a postdoctor fellowship at the University of California, um, he taught courses in uh, Spanish studies, ethnic studies, immigration and labor for nine years in the Department of Comparative Ethnic Studies at Washington State University. His research focuses on ways Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans have used culture, leisure, and sports to build community and social networks to advance politically and economically in the United States. His family experiences in the lemon industry inspired his first book, Making Lemonade Out of Lemons, Mexican-American Labor and Leisure in a California Town. And he co-authored a textbook on Latinos in sport titled uh, Latinos in U.S. Sport, A History of Isolation, Cultural Identity and Acceptance. And um, he has published a couple of other things. And he has also helped out with this exhibit that we have at the museum on um, Latino baseball. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jose. So thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for a nice introduction. And welcome, everybody. Um, I know that, um, you know, um, this is a uh, for me, at least a rainy day, but it, it, I know the rain's coming towards you, so watch out. <laughs> you may get snow. Uh, I know you're in Park City, Utah. Um, I passed through there. I haven't really stopped, but next time I'm going to make sure I stop there and, you know, take advantage of the nice, beautiful surroundings. Um, like Diane said, I was at Washington State University for almost nine years, so I know pretty much that area of Idaho, Utah, I've gone and traveled in, in, in lots of parts of Utah, especially the national parks. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to just sharing with you a little bit about what went into putting this exhibit together. I was one of uh, 14, I think, total consultants that were um, on the exhibit of Play Bowl in the Barrios and the Big Leafs. And it's a bilingual um, exhibit that you'll definitely get to see uh, hopefully you'll invite your Spanish-speaking friends um, to come because I think that's one of the the, the really uh, innovative um, things about this exhibit is it's very uh, inclusive of you know Spanish speakers um, and that was one of the goals from the very beginning is to make it really you know inviting um, to a, a larger broader audience. So uh, let me go ahead and share with you a kind of like at a PowerPoint. Um, that I want to share kind of what went in, into putting this exhibit together and some of the role that um, students played in that community uh, involvement and so forth. So let me just go ahead and share my screen and hopefully you can hear me okay and see the exhibit. Okay, good. Um, just let me know if, if for some reason you can't hear. Or... So I'm going to go ahead and kind of walk you through some of the behind the scenes that went into um, putting together uh, the exhibition. So it really started with um, the Smithsonian inviting partners from all over the United States. Uh, we were one of 30 partners in 14 states. So in 2016, we were um, invited to join this sort of national um, documentation project that would become uh, ultimately the, the exhibition that you'll see. Right, but it really began at the community level, right? It began with essentially teachers, museum curators, uh, community, his local historians, um, to kind of partnering together with different institutions at the local level, right? So, um, so the Latino Baseball History Project really, it that's really the beginnings of the Play Bowl exhibition, um, because if it wasn't for the Latino Baseball History Project. I don't think you would see the richness and 
history of the exhibit. Because uh, uh, the Latino Basel History Project is one that began much earlier. In fact, um, the, 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 the Latino Basel History Project began in 2010. And in 2010, um, there were several curators and um, that really were interested in trying to figure out a way to highlight the Latino contributions to baseball. So they really started with just asking around who knew of any teens. And, and so um, he had, uh, you had Terry Cannon, who Terry Cannon was a librarian at the Pasadena, California. And he had uh, really been in charge of this, um, this museum that he kind of started called the Baseball, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The it was a it was a it was a Pasadena Library mm -hmm. exhibition uh, dedicated to Latinos in baseball. Um and this really began sort of the the beginnings of the start of a partnership. He partnered with uh, several local historians, one in particular that's really crucial to the Latino Baseball History Project by the name of Richard Santillan. Richard Santillan was a professor at Cal Poly. He was always interested in documenting the history of local baseball teams. Um, and then they wanted to also partner with librarians. So they reached out to librarians in, um, in the CSU system. So they, they found the librarian at CSU San Bernardino. Um, and um, there they were able to partner with, with the library there um, to really house a lot of the photographs that you'll see, some of them I'll show you. And then also, um, you know, they reached out to me because I, at that time, had just moved back to California, I was in Washington State and, you know, just gotten back and I was starting a project documenting the local history, baseball history of the Ventura County area where I'm from. So behind me is my campus. This is Cal State Chano Islands. And it's located in the city of Camarillo. And Camarillo, um, if you know this area, it's sandwiched between Santa Barbara and LA. So I'm a little bit north of LA. And here we have a rich baseball history that I wanted to document. And, and then what, one of the things that I did is I, I wanted to use, um, you know, local museums to partner with the, you know, Museum of Ventura County, the Oxford Public Library, um, and then also some softball teams. I wanted to really highlight the local softball teams because you know, many of them go way back into the 1940s. So, um, and then um, we also reached out to the La Plaza de Cultura y Artes Museum, which is a relatively new museum in LA. And it's really one of the kind of premier museums really highlighting Latino, Latina contributions in the region. And then of course, the Smithsonian National Museum comes in as well, uh, becomes a really crucial partner. So that is to say that there was a lot of players in this, um, Museum, you know, I mentioned 30 partners, but, you know, they held a lot of community events, um, over 17, I believe, total, and all across the United States, principally in most of the states that they visited were in, like, Florida, California, Illinois, Colorado, New York, um, and, and Puerto Rico as well, right, because there's a rich history, of course, in Puerto Rico of baseball. Um, so here locally, what I did, and just kind of share with you kind of how I started is that I started with just putting together a local exhibition in the museum local here in Ventura County. So I partnered with the curator Ana Bermudez, who was really um, helpful in helping me identify some of the teams and, and some of the former players. Um, and so what I did is I, I had my students go out and, and do uh, some kind of like, you know, community uh, engagement, uh, meaning that they would find out who the players were, they would ask questions about the photograph, identify many of the team names, and then try to see if they're still around, right? Because we wanted to also get some inter oral history interviews in there as well. So uh, we put together a, a, an exhibit in September 12th, um, and this, this exhibition um, started with just really kind of highlighting some of the local teams and then we decided that like you know what we really need is more than just an exhibit but we need to put this together into a, like a book format of a, a photograph so we 
reached out to uh, Richard Santillan from the Latino Baseball History Museum. Um, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> this is why I need to get water. <laughs> And uh, Richard really put us in touch with Arcadia Publishing, and Arcadia Publishing um, has done, done all these photo documentation, photo books um, that are really useful and really um, eye-opening because if you open them up, right, you see photos that really come from family albums, right? So many of these are just never seen photos. So um, he had already published several in the LA area, and. And Richard was kind of like a mentor to me and Anna in terms of just kind of guiding us through the process of getting this together. And then we use um, the help of students. I mentioned like Juan Canchola Ventura, who's in the uh, co-author, right? He was one of the students, right? That helped us in terms of investigating a lot of the teams. And so we basically put together a, a really wonderful collection of photographs. We asked Jessica Mendoza, who's, you know, Jessica Mendoza is being one of the first, right, woman baseball broadcasters, who's also Latina, right? And so she became important because she wrote the foreword to our book. And, and that was like, oh, that was, a, that was even before she became widely known as sort of one of the really pioneer, right, broadcasters now that you get to hear, um, you know, broadcasting all kinds of baseball matches. And so... She um, blessed us with this foreword, and that then really, um, you know, became really important. She also visited uh, some of the exhibitions, and here's just a couple photos of the exhibition that we put together. Um, one of the things that we really found really useful is to kind of bring in target families, because within families, you have multi-generational families that play, played sports, especially in the, in the sport of baseball. So we invited many of them, like former coaches, and um, you know their um, their family um, who you know also wanted to join in in, in the festivities. Here I have photos of like uh, my parents, my dad, who's also a big baseball fan. So I invited him too. Um, so he was in many ways an inspiration for me to like begin to document some of the early baseball teams that that were really you know that he had been part of, but also uh, many of my siblings who played in the region. Um, so. This is really kind of like the beginnings of, you know, this partnership that ultimately becomes um, one that, you know, becomes really important in terms of, you know, connecting the Smithsonian to local uh, players who can then donate, you know, their artifacts, their photographs to the exhibition, many of them that you will see in the exhibition. Um, so these are just uh, the book signing event that we had. And here we have um, both male and female players. So we have next to me, we have Ernie um, uh, Navarro, who was a former softball player. Um, and she's signing the book because she's featured prominently in, in there. Um, then you have the student kind of showing um, the photos to the uh, the some of the players that attended the signing, and then you have Buddy Salinas, who's right on this on the upper on the lower right, um, who talks about his playing days. Uh, he's a former manager of Little League uh, teams, and so he's talking about you know some of his um, former players, and some of them went on to become major league players. Um, he has this really great story that was featured in the LA Times later about his about his experience in, in the sport of baseball um, as a young man. So one of the things we also wanted to do was to highlight the role of females in the sport. So you will see in the Smithsonian exhibition how important that is. Um, so the way to do that, we put together a exhibition in our library and where it wasn't just really bringing some of the players and then talk about their experience like you would do like in a panel discussion. But we did a whole first pitch, first pitch ceremony. We invited the local softball teams. We had them, you know, uh, we, we gave them a uh, baseball. So then they had them signed um, by the female players that played. So we wanted to kind of feature a kind of a local version of a league of their own, right? So you know Penny Marshall's movie, League of Their Own, right? But we want to kind of highlight the Mexican-American woman's role in that um and so we basically reached out to many um local players and one like you'll see here in the baseball card marge villa 
And Marge Villa, you'll hear more about, you'll see her story in the exhibition uh, because she, she came to visit um, our campus and she showed, shared her story uh, with many of the softball players. So here you have a panel that was put together by myself and then, uh, you know, Marge Villa along with Ernest Navarro and then Sandra Ribe and Sandra Ribe was the facilitator of the panel discussion. Um, you'll see in the exhibition, a lot of like the, you know, catcher gloves, um, old baseballs, cleats and, and many of the equipment that was used in the old days of the 1940s and 50s. So a lot of those um, artifacts we collected and then Smithsonian, what's really cool about the Smithsonian, right? They have the means to then have like photo stations with like be able to photograph two dimensional objects. So it's really great. So whenever they attend a community event, right? They bring this like photo station and they have these like really cool fancy uh, camera um, and equipment and the, you know, they have the capabilities, right? To really uh, let show the three dimensional object, right? Um, and then um, the first pitch ceremony was really successful. You see some of the former players there, uh, you know, pitching the baseball there. Um, and then the signing of the baseballs that we gave away. That was really useful because, um, you know, the 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 young women were really, the young girls were really inspired by the stories of some of the old timers who played the game. And so it was really kind of inspirational to kind of highlight the role of females in the sport, right? Because usually it's very male dominated, but uh, we wanted to kind of talk about baseball and softball together, not just, you know, just do one or the other. Um, then what we did is we, as a class, I, I offered a class where I had students and partner with not the local museum, but the LA museum. So this is the um, LA museum who wanted to do an exhibition on uh, the LA baseball story, right? So highlight sort of the Latinos in LA baseball. Um, and they put together a really a remarkable exhibition. Um, and we just kind of were ones that helped with that research part of it. And we did a lot of the research for that exhibition um, and also participated in some of the panels. So I, I facilitated one in particularly that was uh, kind of one that I really wanted to highlight was the Baseball Sin Fronteras panel. It's a conversation about Mexican American ballplayers who played in the Mexican Baseball League. I wanted to highlight how, you know, we talk about, um, you know, baseball, it wasn't just a national sport, it was a transnational and international sport, right? So uh, I wanted to highlight the role of these uh, players who who not just played within the US, but played in like international leagues. So many of them, you know, went to Mexico to play in, in their um, professional league. And very similar to how the Negro Leagues, right, when they couldn't play in the US, they would go south, right? And they play in the Mexican Baseball League. So you see here um, a, a photo of my students who helped in the documentation of this exhibit. Um, and it was really well received because you know, during a lot of these panel discussions, a lot of the, and the audience would come and kind of share their story and, and then they wanted us to help them document it. And so it kind of attracted like even more interest in terms of wanting to uh, really be part of it in some way. Um, and so the panels, here's a picture of some of the panelists, formal players that I helped, you know, put together in, in the panel. And then uh, we had an all female panel as well. Here you have two of the former players and then two of the younger uh, scholars, Patricia uh, Pris Priscilla Leva on the black and Sandra Ribe in the blue. So there were young uh, scholars who helped in the documentation of the female players. And so they were there to kind of, you know, facilitate the discussion and so forth. So um, another thing we did is we, we like I mentioned, the, we, the Latino Baseball History Project uh, partner then with the Smithsonian and this partnership right was really crucial because um, in 2016 that's really that was really the beginning of the Smithsonian kind of reaching out to the Latino Baseball History Project and many other partners to kind of begin that process of collecting and borrowing the artifacts the photographs and so forth um, so here's kind of like the program for that two-day event it was really a really important event because, and you'll see kind of who's in the in the in the program. You'll see who was involved, who participated, and it's kind of like 
you know, started from like the, the head of like the director of the Smithsonian Latino Center, who came and kind of gave an opening speech, Edward, Eduardo Diaz, and then you had Magdalena Mieri, who was a curator, um, and then Margie Salazar Porcio, who becomes really the chief curator of this exhibition. Uh, and then you had other speakers as well. Um, and then um, during this two day, basically what it was, it was that we invited many community members to come out and share their story, bring their photographs, because we really wanted to make sure that they knew that like whatever you bring, whatever you know, you know, you you share with us will be highlighted in the exhibition. So a lot of the photos that you'll see in the exhibition come from this two day event, right? That was open to the public. Um, and it was really a great event because we really um were surprised by one visitor that get and that's Fernando Valenzuela. So during that event, we didn't realize that Fernando Valenzuela would come and Kind of bless the Smithsonian <laughs> partnership with the with with the Latino Baseball History Project. So here's this photo of me and Fernando with my students who were so excited because they wanted to be photographed with Fernando Valenzuela. You know, again, a big hero, an important figure in the history of Latinos in baseball. At least, especially if you're a big Dodgers fan, right? And uh, and also. Um, because um, we were in Southern California, right? It made sense, right, to bring a celebrity <laughs> um, to kind of bless the the collection and the documentation of this, you know, of this exhibition. So this is a a photo that I wanted to share with you because it's it's still a big highlight in, in many of the memories. Um, once the students, um, so one of the things that I had with with students did is that they uh, collected all history interviews. And then they took photos of their interviewees. So here's just a kind of like one of their end of the semester assignments that they, after they collected their interviews, they put together kind of like a poster of all they've done. So this is a, the poster, this is a poster of the Latino Baseball History Project where they kind of show like, what was the outcomes? What was some of the lessons learned? Um, and let's see what else. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the the culmination of like a whole semester long class um, in 2016. And this is again the collection day. So this this here actually was not the collection. This was actually the this is when um, so this is like right after when this when we got when we had that two day event. The Smithsonian wanted to bring us out to the Smithsonian itself to hold a series of panel discussions. Um, and they wanted to kind of really begin like the uh, the the uh, the discussion around like, okay, who, you know, who, what were some of the gaps of the exhibition? We want to highlight, you know, what we're missing. And I think one of the 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 biggest gap was that there weren't enough females represented. And so initially it was titled Latinos in Baseball, again, highlighting mostly men's involvement in the sport, because even in the term Latinos is kind of highlighting the role of men. So I think that so that I think after that discussion, we had um, you know, mm -hmm. we really started to, and this is the this is the photo I wanted to share with you. This is sort of when we were at the Smithsonian and had this event. We wanted to kind of highlight the role of females. And so we had uh, Sarah and Priscilla kind of, you know, highlight what role did women play in the sport. And so I think at that point, we realized that we wanted to kind of maybe change the exhibition name from Latinos in baseball to play ball, right? It was more gender neutral and and still highlighting like the subtitle, which is in the bodies in the big leagues, right? So kind of continue to use that uh, as a subtitle. but. And we also realized that what we needed to do was also kind of, you know, do these player reunions events. So the player reunion events was also key for this exhibition because essentially these were these community events in which um, we would basically organize kind of reunions for the former players. And then after we held these sort of reunions, then we would visit their homes, right? And then collect many of the artifacts. So here's a photograph of me in one of the reunions this was in Carpinteria, California. I participated in this, this panel with a lot of the former players from that town. And then you see like in the standing room only community building, 
just how much interest there was. A lot of a lot of them were really just fascinated by how, you know, these were local heroes to the community. They were sharing all these wonderful stories about what, you know, what they did, you know, before, during, and after playing the sport. Um, because it wasn't just about playing a sport. It was more than it was it was about building community. It was about developing skills and leadership abilities, organizing more than just baseball clubs, but really more mutual aid societies, because many of these clubs continue to be kind of strong community organizations. Uh, some of them end up being civil rights groups. Um, I mean, so we find it like that they're really kind of more than just baseball reunions, right? They become kind of community reunions in some way. And it was like, you know, and so I, I collected the scrapbook that you'll see featured in the Smithsonian. And this was a scrapbook donated by the Orozco family. And I talk a lot about the Orozco family being a really important to the, you know, the the, the uh, community baseball um, in LA region. Um, they, the, the Rose Schools were really part of one of the perhaps most successful semi-pro teams called Mexico El Paso in Southern California. And they were a barnstorming team which traveled all over uh, south the Southwest, into Mexico, they, they, you know, they even went abroad and played internationally, right? So this was a semi-pro team where, you know, players will play and they get paid for it, right? It was more than, it was a job for many of them. Um, so I had many of the players interviewed um, and and after the that sort of panel discussion, we got together and took a big photograph outside. So here is the kind of the entire group of folks that you see here who part was part of putting together this exhibition. Um, you see many of them featured here. You um, and, and so it's, it was a big group, right, that really um, got together um, on, on that that day in, at the museum. And then one of the other things we wanted to do was to kind of have like a, com a, com a companion book uh, to accompany the exhibition. So you see, this is the book that was published uh, right as the exhibit is opening up. Um, and this was edited by the curator, uh, Margie uh, Salazar Porzio. And then she partnered with Adrian Burgos Jr., who's a scholar of baseball. Um, and that's it. That's the book where um, many of them who contributed, I contributed an essay in that book. I don't know if you have copies of that book at the Park City Museum, but definitely if you do, you can kind of see um, all the different layers and, and um, essays that accompany many of the exhibition sections, right? So, um, so yeah, this that's kind of what I wanted to share with you all about how this all, you know, was put together. Um, it was a lot of work, um, but I could, you know, definitely share more if you're interested in terms of like, you know, some of the challenges we face, some of the, you know, um, you know, struggles that we, you know, we had initially and the successes, right? Um, and a lot of the finds that we, you know, we had. So definitely, you know, I'm open to any questions that you may have. That's not the sharing for now. John, Patty, do you have any questions or comments you want to make? Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, displacement of the community at Chavez Ravine? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, so when we put together, so in the in the um, um, baseball, you know, the 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 Peloteros in Paradise, the the Los Angeles baseball story. One of the things we did is we highlighted the Chavez Ravine story, right? Um, what was interesting about that is that we had many former residents um, attending the exhibit and were really, you know, happy to see themselves in the exhibit because they thought, oh, they're just going to feature the Dodgers, but not the community in which they, you know, basically was displaced, right, to build the Dodger Stadium. But one of the things we did is we did highlight many of the uh, residents who were active in playing baseball. I mean, many of the, you know, communities of what was Chavez Ravine were baseball players uh, at the community level. So we highlighted their role, but we also highlighted sort of the opposition to the building of, uh, or the displacement, right? We highlighted the struggle to maintain and keep their homes. Um, and we highlighted the displacement that, that was done by the Dodgers. Uh, the Dodgers was not part of the exhibition. <laughs> they didn't want to be part of it. And we asked if they wanted to be, but they refused. 
So they, they allowed us kind of some freedom to do more with it, right? To kind of highlight that story, you know, and to this day, you know, um, we, we, we found that a lot of residents, right, will still not, you know, go to the game because of that, the bitter feelings that remain. And so, um, and so we, but, but, you know, we, we were ready to kind of engage that and talk about it. We wanted the residents to express that as well. And so you have all kind of diverse opinions, you know, from the former residents. Many of them, of course, are still bitter. But some of them, you know, you know, after generations gravitated his tours um, in part because of the role of Fernando Valenzuela, right? He becomes really key in terms of bringing in many players back to the Dodger Stadium, kind of kind of healing a little bit of that. But again, still to this day, many of them refuse to set foot on Dodger Stadium. Um, I always feel like, you know, the Dodgers franchise needs to do more to engage the, the descendants of the Chavez Ravine. And I and I feel like it's it's an opportunity that like it's lost and they need to you know really not just bury it, <laughs> ignore it, but to really engage it in in such a way that like opening up the conversation you know and it's not a it's not an easy conversation it's a it's a, it's definitely a difficult conversation but we need to kind of highlight the fact that yes many many of the residents were um, displaced and they still you know, her bad feelings, right, about that. Um, because, you know, again, those public houses were never built, right? And instead, the Dodgers, you know, came and built the stadium. Something you wanted to ask? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Arturo, oh, yeah. Olivia, oh, yeah. I'm wondering if you played baseball. Yeah. Um, I did. I I played um, little league. <laughs> I did. I did. So I I was more of a little league player. Um, not not more than that. Um, but my 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 siblings and my family and my uncles and my dad and they're all big baseball fans. So we're a big Dodgers fan fan family, I yeah. guess. Um, and I think for us, it was well. I mean, part of it was that you know, baseball for us wasn't just something we did in the U.S. It was something we played in Mexico. So this was nothing new in terms of a sport, right? When you think about Latinos in baseball, people forget that sometimes they're already coming with that knowledge and skills of playing it in their homeland, right? So when you think about many of the players, like even you know, in the championship, right, match between the Phillies and the Houston Astros, many of them, you know, come with incredible you know, knowledge and skill already in having played that in Cuba, Dominican Republic, all over the Latin America, right? So they're coming in. And so similarly, like us, we had played it in Mexico. So we already came into the U.S. with like looking for teams, <laughs> you know, and looking mm -hmm. for where to play. And so it was very familiar to us, something that was just part of a family tradition in many ways. So for yeah. us, it was very natural to gravitate to that sport, uh, you know, but I, I would say that it was mostly because it was family it was a family entertainment right you know mm -hmm. it brought family together it brought cousins together but extended family together it, it then became kind of like that's what you expected to do you know uh so that's really where it started for me you know just as mm -hmm. a as a as kind of one that played but also was one that really was interested in studying it not just playing it you know mm -hmm. um this is patty that was my husband mark <laughs> Um, there's a lovely video circulating about groups of Mayan women in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula who started softball teams, and it's it's been a way for them to find their own voice and their own game within their communities, um, mm -hmm. which really it really struck me watching it. Um, it you know it was lovely, but it was also kind of an indication of the. I guess for men, it's the fraternity. For women, it's the sorority that comes from team sports and working with people and working with your community. Yeah, yeah I think you're referring to the Las Amazonas, the uh, yes. right. Yejuna, right. Yucatan. Yeah, all indigenous women softball team. Definitely. I think I definitely saw that kind of... Um, that community building, that sort of sense of empowerment with females who played with other females. I found that in the 1940s and 50s with many of the all-female teams, the all League of Their Own, right? League of Their Own, of course, mm -hmm. and, and World War right too. That's huge inspiration for many of them. But definitely 
you see that being um, not just a community building, but also like developing a sense of confidence and yeah. and the ability to like, you know what, if I could do this, if I could hit a home run, I could do more. I can create my own business, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak, you know. And so it is a very empowering sport for, for young women and mm -hmm. especially indigenous women, right? Uh, the ability to, and then what I loved about the, the, that team is, right, they use their traditional, um, you know, upil dresses, right? That they actually don't use the sort of the old, the like, you know, uniforms, right? They're using their kind of traditional, uh, you know, dresses to play. Mm -hmm. And they could play in dresses. I mean, if a league of their own could play skirts, <laughs> why couldn't they play with be dresses? <laughs> True. You know, well, the the pants the men wear are kind of weird, <laughs> anyway, aren't they? I, you know. <laughs> Here we go. There was a there was an interesting story. Um, I'm I'm a fourth generation St. Louis Cardinal fan, and it's it's been certainly a way. My my family we have deep divisions politically, but we can agree that the Cardinals are, you know, our team, and so it's a way that our families kind of maintain the connections. That um, it's really quite lovely, and so there was a player for the Cardinals who got traded to the Yankees. His name is Harrison Bader. He's their center fielder now, mm -hmm. and he grew up in the Bronx. But he grew up in a very exclusive, white, well-to-do section of the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And that was all he knew until he joined um, a traveling team from the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And he got to know the African-American, the Caribbean-American, Latin American neighbors and families. Mm -hmm. And he said it was, it was the best experience growing up to become connected to all of those neighbors that he had otherwise would never probably never meet right? i love that right the ability the, the, the ability to build cross cultural relationships friendships right and it, but also exposing them to other you know other cultures right other yeah. ways of being yeah. and knowing um i think that's beautiful i think the fact that it's such an international sport right lends itself especially because it's a traveling traveling team um mm -hmm. and and also the language barrier right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know to like overcome that right because that's the one thing right that there it's kind of has its own language on its own right like you could understand baseball language and you don't need to <laughs> you, know, so you should you tell need the to, story right that's all you need yeah. Patty's got a great story about Well, it. I'm old so I remember when Fernando Valenzuela was playing and I remember watching a game where Tommy Lasorda, the manager who spoke very little Spanish, walked out to the mound to hand Valenzuela the ball and he said, double play, por favor. <laughs> that was about the extent of the Spanish. <laughs> that sounds like Tommy Lasorda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> what do you know about the the south american contingent uh venezuela occasionally you'll get uh some players from elsewhere in south america yeah like you mean like adulbe garcia gonzalez Silly, right right from, i, I think like, uh, yeah alvarez alvarez yeah, yeah. no i think though those are you know, Venezuela has always been a huge baseball country. I think in part of like, you know, it's it's proximity to Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. Cuba, uh, Dominican Republic. I think it's it's one of those countries that has produced a lot, a lot, a lot of um, players along with Central America, like even Nicaragua, you know, mm -hmm. uh, most of in Colombia. Right. But I think it has to do with. Um, in the 1940s and 50s, you had a lot of goodwill baseball exhibitions happening um, down in South America, Central America. And it was part of the good neighbor policy. If you remember, the good neighbor policy was about, you know, being good neighbors from the to the south, the south or southern neighbors. And so they would use baseball as a way to build good neighborness, you know, goodwill, right, between the countries. And so a lot of the army teams that were stationed down there, they would play baseball 
uh, matches with a lot of the local teams. And especially like in Venezuela, you know, um, Nicaragua in particular, that's where you see really, um, they become really hotbeds for baseball talent. Um, and so I think it's attributed to, I think that, that sort of those early baseball exhibitions and, and matches that were played with the army military. Um, and and they, they, they didn't, I would say, didn't make inroads in Southern, the Southern corner of South America, like, you know, Argentina, Brazil, uh, those are more soccer countries, right? Uh, Chile. Um, I think it was a little bit more difficult to make inroads in terms of the spreading of the baseball as a kind of a form of, you know, diplomacy. Um, I think that that was a little bit more of a challenge, um, you know, because I think the they were greatly influenced by more European sports like soccer. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and so soccer was much more popular. Um, where Venezuela, you know, remained very strong baseball, right? having a strong baseball tradition. Um, and you see a lot of, yeah, a lot of Venezuelans, a long history of Venezuelans, right? They've been really, really great players. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think it's it's interesting how when you look at South America, there's quite a difference in terms of which sport becomes the most popular, you know. Uh, and I think it had to do where the where kind of the military presence in many of these countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they even made like baseball films to try to transmit baseball down to southern South America. I mean, they, you know, Disney was also involved in that, like making these Disney films. Uh, but the you know Major League Baseball also may produce a film with um, you know um, they had um, Ted Williams being like a, a you know kind of one of the stars kind of you know introducing the, the sport down you know in South America wasn't it successful though <laughs> you know Ted Williams is interesting right because he you know people like know him as a sort of this great player but he was of Mexican descent right I mean his mother was Mexican from from Tucana. But people didn't know that at the time. And in fact, even later, you know, he's like, yeah, I couldn't, if I, if my name was, you know, the last name is my mother, I wouldn't be able to play the sport of baseball. So I had to, you know, mm -hmm. had to, I had to maintain that kind of like, just pass as Ted Williams. <laughs> where, 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 where was his mom from? From Tijuana, Mexico. Yeah, no, that's yeah. fascinating. I, I, I didn't realize that. that that's mm -hmm. a great, great bit of history. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's actually in the new biography of Ted Williams, uh, it goes into that side of the family. Um, I'm trying to remember the the name, the last name of the family, but it's um, Dolores. No, no, it wasn't Dolores. That was his wife. Um, I can't remember the the name, the last name of his mother. But uh, but yeah, there's the, all these cousins from they, a lot of the cousins were from. Um, the mom's side of the family, they were from Tijuana, but then many of the many of them moved to Santa Barbara and remained there. Um, but um, yeah, and so they interviews a lot of the cousins, <laughs> you know, who like, yeah, Ted never really accepted us. <laughs> They're still kind of bitter. I think it's Ben Sor, yeah. Uh, the Natalia Hernandez Ben Sor was the last name, it's the mother's. Mm -hmm. So the Bensor family. I, I can just imagine that you had thousands of these kinds of conversations at these meetings with, with families. It must have been a lot of fun. Oh my God. I think the, the my favorite were the player reunions. Um, they were the most fun. Uh, just because, it, you know, again, it was it was really sharing these little nuggets of history that you would never have read anywhere, right? Like there were just stories about like, you know, makeshift diamond fields they had to put together <laughs> with very little, right? Like, you know, you couldn't play in the bigger ballpark, so they had to just kind of construct these makeshift ball fields, you know, um, in like agricultural fields or any right. other space they could I find. Grew up. I grew up in the country and we played in pastures. That's how like yeah. 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 Yeah, like sand lots, right? These sand lots become I mean, just uh, you know, just fascinating stories about the sand lots that were converted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and all, the, all, all that from like, you know, still holding on to like their little, you know, scorecards, <laughs> the handbills they had to use, right? To like advertise the matches. <laughs> their handbills were really important. Like they kept their, you know, their little medals or the little ribbons, right? Um, little, little mementos of it, you know, was kind of just, God, you know, this is what we need in the museum, right? If we could just, you know, hand them over to the Smithsonian, you know, a lot of them were a little wary about just handing it over, right? They didn't want to let go of it. So, um, you know, they, they would create this sort of like, okay, well, you could borrow it, right? You can lend them to the Smithsonian. But, but you know, be, you know so you'd be surprised. A lot of them just let go because they knew there was going to be the Smithsonian. So that's all you needed to know. This is national history. This is like huge, right? So like the the scrapbook that um, I mentioned earlier by the Roscoe family, that was um, uh, a scrapbook that, you know, um, was, you know, donated by the Orozco families and they had a huge event and a huge signing and, a, you know, it was a big deal. A lot of their relatives came, they're dressed up, you know, and because it, it meant that much for, for them to kind of hand over this scrapbook, but it was an, an amazing scrapbook that highlighted just and documented every match they played, every ball game. Um, and, the, you know, the, the bios of all the players and just so much detail and so much history that, like, you would never find, you know, anywhere else, but but in somebody's closet, <laughs> you know, but now it's part of this exhibition. So um, definitely check out the, the Rose Score scrapbook. It's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. you, you have a PhD, correct? I do. And what was your, your PhD thesis on it? So I, I didn't really begin to study baseball in my in my in my dissertation. I, I looked at my thing, my main dissertation was looking at citrus communities uh, uh, that were founded around the lemon industry in Southern California. And particularly I focus in one town in, in the Inland Empire called Corona, California. And Corona, California was this a lemon industry town that was really um, um kind of dependent on the lemon industry, it had one of the largest lemon byproducts plant, it had or surrounded by orchards. And so what I did is I documented some of the history of the workers of that town, predominantly Mexican workers. And so, um, you know, I stumbled into baseball because that's what they did for fun. Like on Sundays, that was the one day they would play baseball and um, and so the reason why I began to write about it is because that's all they wanted to talk about. So I kind of like ended up going where they led me to. And, you know, because I would ask them about the work and the wages and the, you know, the, but they're like, no, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I want to talk about when I hit that home run, you know, when I hit that triple and, you know, we won the championship. And, and, and they wanted to show me the photos of the, of the, of the teams and they wanted to talk about the players. And I'm like, Okay, I think there's a, I think they're trying to tell me something. I think they want to tell me that it wasn't just about work, but it was about like the the fun they had playing baseball and how much how much it brought the community together, how much how much it was still part of their memory, right? And so I had to honor that. I had to honor that memory and I had to write about it. So in my first book, that's what I write about. I talk about the labor problem issues and labor, you know, struggles they had, you know, because it wasn't easy, right? You know, working in a in a in a kind of a agriculture industry where they weren't paid a whole lot they you know it, 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 but but on sundays they at least had a baseball game waiting for them <laughs> so and it wasn't just the men it was the women too like the women were like also playing and and they made sure to let me know they're like hey while the men were playing we were also playing but in a different field <laughs> you know and so it was like okay i got i get that let's let's go there let's 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 I want to hear more about that. And so I had to honor their stories. And I so I just couldn't ignore, right? That baseball was a big part of their life. And mm -hmm. and you know, despite all the hard work, you know, that's what they did for fun. And there was no TV then, there was no other form of entertainment. It was baseball on a weekend, you know, and if you weren't playing, you were watching. <laughs> yeah, that's uh that's that's very, very cool to hear. Out of curiosity. As a baseball fan, not necessarily uh, a cultural aspect, 
But what do you think about Major League Baseball going to the electronic strike zone? Uh, yeah, I have some <laughs> reservations about that. I mean, I, I feel like, I mean, I understand why they're doing that. I mean, I, I get it. It probably will resolve a lot of, like, bitter feelings and prevent fights and arguments and <laughs> managers being kicked out of the game and all that. <laughs> But I don't know, like, I feel like, you know, it, it's almost like uh, sometimes we're relying on technology, you know, to take over so many aspects of, of sports. And I just wondering if like, we're taking up, we're taking away the human dimension, you know, uh, the role of umpires, right? What What is their role then? Right? <laughs> yeah, you I mean, the, the human element uh, isn't just the players. It's, it's also the officiating and- uh... Right. Right. Yeah, I, I, I do understand the reasoning behind it, but I think it's a mistake. Mm -hmm. I, I guess there's a, lar there's a larger question: Is that is, do historians embrace change? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Come on, Jose, we're putting you on the spot. No, well, they have to because that's what they study. <laughs> 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 they wouldn't have a job then. No, we have to look at change and we have to look at why, you know, things change over time, right? And I think that's a big, that's a big part of what we do is, is you know, why at this particular moment in time, right? That we're now finally turning to technology. You know, we've had this technology available, but like, why now, right? Like, why in this moment, right? It says a lot about our society, like in terms of, you're not just in the sport of baseball, but like in other, other sports as well. You've seen that in like tennis, for example, it's relying more on technology to, you know, for calls, whether they're in or out. Um, you know, again, it's kind of taking away the officiating a lot from the hands, right? I mean, there's still some discretion that they could use, but still it's like, then pretty soon we're not going to have any more like ball kids or, or umpires, you know? <laughs> um so yeah, I think it's it's uh you know technology taking over our lives in many ways in so many dimensions, right? I mean, we rely on our iPhone, our our phone for everything. <laughs> all this where it's like hearing and listening to us and predicting what we want, and then all of a sudden you get an ad for the, oh my god, how do they know I wanted this? <laughs> it's kind of scary. I like my iPhone, but I don't want them to change the operating system. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's definitely, I de yeah, definitely part of you know the zeitgeist of today, right? Of where technology is is going, you know, so many different parts of our lives, it's changing a lot of things. So I guess you know historians much later we'll look down and see okay now i know why you all shifted mm -hmm. to this look at all those like you know those fights <laughs> so look at all those incidents like look at all those i don't know we'll see yeah, i mean it's it's technology has invaded almost every major sport it really but, has um, yeah you got the basketball baseball football yeah, yeah. tennis and of course, yeah. track and field is super uh, technology oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Jose, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, I thank know you for joining it, us. Thank it you. Wasn't a, it wasn't a large crowd, but that has that has nothing to do with with how uh, how much we enjoyed that the your presentation. It was terrific. Yeah. Very true. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thank for you having Jose, me. and thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. So. Yeah. We're looking forward to the exhibit. Yeah. Okay. Yes, if you come in, we're please, open. Please, so please see the exhibit and let me know what you think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. look forward to seeing. Thanks. Bye. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye -bye.